morning and um, thank you for allowing me to have this speak here. So this is a session on, uh, on uh, ischemic heart disease, the ST elevation myocardial infarction, and my talk is on uh, the management of clot and reflow. So I think we all understand that primary PCI has revolutionized the treatment, and the basic intention of primary PCI is to achieve a rapid recanalization of the epicardial infarct-related artery, and thereby reduce the infarct size. But we know that a large population of patients still have a suboptimal tissue perfusion, and this is related mostly to either a large thrombus burden or a prothrombotic milieu. And unfortunately, there are no strong recommendations in the presence of a large thrombus burden. And this is the trimethrombus score that has been used. And we all agree that one to three is something that is usually considered as a mild thrombotic burden, whereas four and five basically classify themselves as a high thrombotic burden. And we all agree that uh, the problems which are associated with the large thrombus burden may mostly concern the distal embolization, which can be spontaneous or it can be secondary to instrumentation. When we take our balloons, we take our suction catheters, we could probably push the thrombus down. And this can lead to either a reocclusion or a slow flow, no flow situation. Or you can also get retrograde embolization. So when you're doing a suction or when you have a balloon, you can pull back the thrombus, say, from a and left anterior descending artery onto a non-culprit circumflex. Or you can also have systemic embolization going to the brain and causing TIAs or strokes. And uh, how do we assess this? Well, it's mostly at the basis of TIMI flows and by the presence of myocardial blush and clinical ST resolutions and, of course, relief of symptoms. The strategies to tackle thrombus are many. Well, we have pharmacological and we have mechanical. And we also use uh, the P2 Vitwell inhibitors, the GP2B3 inhibitors, which now are coming down because of the presence of more potent P2 Vitwell inhibitors. We often, often can often use intracoronary thrombolytics. And of course, you have the mechanical uh, thrombectomy devices and the strengthening strategies that we're going to talk about. Uh, when it comes to thrombosuction, I think there's been a lot of confusion and a lot of debate. We had the TAPIS trial, which had shown initial good results. But then you had the total and the TASTE trial, which had a huge number of patients, uh, close to around 10,000 patients, which is a neutral study. And we did not have mortality benefits. And as a result of this, the guidelines then went on from a two-way classification to a class three indication where thrombosuction in a primary PCI case is not something that is recommended for all and each and every patient. So the proposed algorithm for management of large thrombotic burden in a patient with PCI basically consists of putting a wire passage and then looking at the distal flow. For small thrombus burden, you could just do a direct stenting, but if you have a thrombus burden that is greater, grade three to five, then one needs to identify what is the distal flow, whether there's ischemia or no ischemia. If there is ischemia, then one needs to act, and there are thrombolytic devices. You need to do a thrombosuction, give distal coronary device, uh, drug delivery. Or if you have no significant ischemia, then one may want to wait. Uh, just a few cases to highlight what we're talking about. An elder, a young gentleman, a smoker, diabetic with an inferior wall infarct. Uh, Okay, so this is a normal left system. The left system is normal, and this is a patient who has come with an inferior wall infarct. And you can see a large thrombotic burden extending from the proximal to the mid part of the right coronary artery. Now, this was a case done almost uh, eight to 10 years back, and we did a thrombosuction, and uh, well, we managed to get some thrombus out. It's now localized more to the proximal part of the proximal right coronary artery. But this is what happens when you do a more aggressive thrombosuction. You push the thrombus down, and this is something very common. And this was again, a thrombosuction was done in the distal part of the right coronary artery to restore flow. And this is what the patient was then left with. So you see that there's not much of a plaque burden and um, a standalone thrombectomy or a thrombus aspiration itself did well. So this was a case many years back, as I said, and this was probably a plaque erosion rather than a plaque rupture. And now in the days of OCT, now that we've started using OCT, you can probably understand that this is something that was known as a plaque erosion that we now know, which ha happens in a, a quite a few number of patients, especially in the young age, who have smoking usually as a pre pre predominant risk factors. And females also tend to have more of a plaque erosion rather than a plaque rupture. So this is how a plaque erosion or a plaque rupture would be differentiate on an OCT image, where you see a thin cap fibrous atheroma, which is ruptured on a plaque rupture, Whereas uh, with a lot of lipid plaque, whereas an erosion would have not so much of a lipid, it's more of fibrotic, uh, not so much of a lipid core, and you can get a, a plaque erosion that is seen there. And this is again one more slide which talks about the erosion vis-a-vis -vis the thrombosis, more of a white thrombus when you have an erosion, 
uh, with not too much of a lipid core, whereas when you have a plaque rupture, you have a thick lipid core with a, a red thrombus that forms there. The next case is again a gentleman who presented with uh, a, a, a right-sided artery that was completely occluded. Uh, yeah, so a normal left system and a right artery that is completely occluded. Now when you pass your wire, you see that you can restore some degree of flow. So this tells us that when you pass a wire and there's a flow that is restored, this is not a huge thrombus burden. And here in this case, you don't really need to do a thrombectomy or you don't need to do a thrombus aspiration. One can just do a balloon dilatation, take a stent, and one has to make sure that the stent is long enough to cover the thrombus. So do not miss out the thrombus, go from healthy to healthy, even a lo little longer than the thrombus that you can see angiographically. And here, once the wire has passed and restored flow, you can directly go and do a stenting with a good result without significant concern about a distant slow flow. This is again a young guy who had come with a non-STACS, treated with nitrates and DAPTs and heparin and a high intensity statins and he improved. And the next day we took him up for an angio and you can see a, a nasty thrombus in the proximal part of the LED. Uh, again, this is a case where you don't want to rush in because if you have a thrombus burden like this and you rush in and put in a stent, you're going to end up with a no flow or slow flow in this situation or you may aspirate the thrombus back into the circumflex. So since this patient was pain free, we continued on tyrofiban for the next 24 hours in addition to the DAPT and his heparin and then again took him up for an angio 48 hours later. Uh, well, uh, this was the OCT images and here you can see that there is a layered thrombus. You can see that in the mid part of the uh, proximal part of the LED, there is a layered thrombus extending from the LED into the left main and uh, the only good thing was that there's no significant lumen narrowing. So the MLA was almost nine millimeters squared. So unless you have an MLA that is less than two square millimeters, you don't want to intervene in this group of patients and you continue with your medications. Uh, since the no occlusion was non, uh, thrombus was non-occlusive, in addition to the uh, GP2B3, we also added them on, on oral anticoagulants and the patient was discharged after a therapeutic INR was achieved. We got him back six weeks later to look at his angiogram. And you can see that there's a complete resolution of the thrombus in the proximal part. And again, an OCT that was done uh, shows that the thrombus is completely, uh, has completely gone away. And another case, this is probably the last case, a 50 years old elderly gentleman with acute inferior wall MI presented late with an eight hours uh, onset of chest pain. There's no RVMI or conduction delays. Well, we took him up for an angio and uh, we saw this is what his right coronary artery was. Oh, well, uh, this was done by one of the fellows. Uh, he wired the artery, did a balloon dilatation there and uh, put in a stent there. You can see that the stent has been put there. And this is what happens. You see, you have slow flow, no flow setting it. So this is a common situation. This is known as a no reflow and basically it depends upon the time to perfusion. So the longer the thrombus burden remains there, the higher the chances of no flow. There are certain patient characteristics. So patients who are hyperglycemic, elderly patients, age more than 70 years, these are the patients who are more likely to have a slow flow. And certain lesion characteristics, a high thrombus burden, large atherosclerotic plaque there, eccentric fissured plaque, and of course certain procedures. So if you do a direct stenting, you're less likely to have a thrombotic burden going down. Trying to do an aggressive post dilatation again causes more of uh, thrombus migration distally. And we also know that rotational atherectomy also has uh, a chance of a slow fl flow. But again, this no reflow phenomenon is a diagnosis of exclusion. So one has to exclude either an incomplete vessel dilatation, coronary dissection. So this is very important. Coronary dissections have to be ruled out before you really call it a no flow. And this could be caused by a balloon, it could be caused by a guide suction or it could be caused even by the wires. So using hydrophilic wires sometimes can cause dissections. And of course, coronary sp spasm or distal lesions also. So here, what, how do you diagnose this? Is by putting a small catheter distally and injecting contrast. For here example, you can see that there's a small lesion there which needed to be tackled. So the management is basically to give bronchodilators, uh, to give vasodilators, give GP2V3 inhibitors, and this has to be given in the distal coronary bed. So one has to use a microcatheter, one has to use a balloon which can be, holes can be made, you can perforate the balloon and then give it distally and adenosine, verapabil, nitroprusside, nicorandil, these are the drugs that are given. We're giving to adenosine and uh, SNP. The data says that we normally use adenosine, it gives an initial good response and we maintain it with SNP or you can use nicorandil also. So in this same patient here after the drug was given, you can see that there is an improvement on flow uh, once the drug was given distally in the coronary bed. 
So conclude thrombosis is an issue when we deal with STEMI. Many times we get away, but in majority of the patients, its effects can be deleterious. You can have LV dysfunction, you can have arrhythmias, and sometimes even death. And the recommendations are not so strong as yet. It's usually a, a personalized approach. And one has to rule out dissection, one has to rule out coronary spasm before one diagnoses as a case of no flow. And the drugs have to be, distal, has to be delivered distally uh, by means of either microcatheters or a small balloon which has perforations before we can diagnose it as a case of uh, slow flow. Thank you.